Thank you so much, Kevin, for the introduction. Um, like Kevin said, my name is Liz Parent, and I am the sales director for Testing Partners. Hang on, let me get this uh, little notice off my screen here. So Testing Partners is a one-stop turnkey partner who provides everything related to regulatory compliance for many types of products. It could be tires, it could be uh, clothing, um, since there are toxins added to our clothing, there are regulations that people have to comply to for that. It could be a Bluetooth product um, or your cell phone. Anything that has to be made is going to have some sort of regulation associated with it. <clears throat> we offer product pre-screening pre and pre-compliance reviews to the actual lab testing that needs to be done. We can oversee the lab testing to help eliminate any problems that are occurring within the labs. Um, and then a wireless and safety certifications, anything that needs to be done having to do with full global certifications, as well as compliance mapping, where we would review what certifications you already have and how we can take those documents to get certifications in other countries too, without reinventing the wheel. I got my start in regulatory compliance around seven or eight years ago. My focus was specifically on wireless and safety certifications for Mexico and South, so South America regions. And then I moved into full global for wireless and safety. And then once I joined testing partners um, a few years ago, now my knowledge and expert, not so much expertise, but my knowledge definitely is all types of products for all regions globally. Uh, Jeff Baum is our managing director who started testing partners. And he has been in the industry for over 25 years, working originally for the largest test labs um, that you guys might have heard of, Intertech, Nemco, CSA, and UL. Um, they eventually, he eventually started testing partners because he saw that there was a gap in the labs and in the industry in which 90% or more, even upwards of 95% or more of the manufacturers who submitted their products to the labs straight from making the product and then sending it over for testing would fail testing right out of the gate because their products weren't properly prepared to meet regulatory standards. It's one thing to have a functioning product and it's another thing to have a product that is actually built according to the standards that it needs to be tested against. No one else was doing um, pre-compliance reviews or product construction reviews that would minimize the risk of failure in the lab. So testing partners started that as a way to save clients up to two or three months in the labs and tens of thousands of dollars in additional testing, um, keeping market launches on schedule. Failing lab tests is quite costly as you might imagine. You will have to, once you fail in the lab, the lab may not necessarily tell you where the failures went. So you would have to go back and fix your product and then pay those costs all over again. If you're being told that it's $40,000 for testing, can you imagine if you fail and you have to pay that 40 grand all over again? They don't just stop in the middle, let you fix it and come back unless we're involved. And then we can do it that way. Uh, so by performing these product construction reviews in advance of going to the lab, you can minimize that risk of failure and keep your budget and timeline on point. World Trade Center Northern California provides the resources for strengthening global connections in an effort to help manufacturers and service providers become as successful as possible in the global industries. Our partnership with them means that you now have an additional resource that can help in a very crucial and legally required aspect of manufacturers' global presence. So having someone like us to come to and WTC to come to about compliance requirements means that you're that much closer as a uh, closer to establishing a strong and legitimate presence within your market. And that legitimate side, it's not just establishing the president, it's the presence, it's showing your consumers that you've taken the legal um, steps to show compliance, which then establishes um, confidence in the consumers who are using your product. So that is my somewhat uh, lengthy introduction of who we are and what testing partners can offer. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now, if that's okay, and just jump right in so that we can stay on time, if that's all right. Yeah, you should be able to go. Okay. And there will be some, hopefully, some time for questions at the end. So if you do have any questions while I'm talking, I won't be able to see them. Uh, but Kevin will keep track of them, and we'll go ahead and pop through some of those questions at the very end. Okay, let me know when you can see that. Can you see my screen, Kevin? Yep, you're in good shape. Great. Great. Okay, so I'm here to provide you today with a quick snapshot of global of the global relation, uh, regulations. 
My sole purpose is to plant a seed in your minds to make you aware that the regulatory standards exist. I am not here to teach you about all the different regulations globally for your specific product or even a handful of specific products, um, nor can I, even if you ask. I know a lot, but I'm not an encyclopedia, so I don't have them all memorized, although there's a few common ones that I do have memorized. Um, but I do. we do, the great thing is that we do have access to all of the different requirements. So anytime there is a question about something that I can't answer, I can definitely get an answer for you. There are way too many regulations and directives to remember. So my purpose today then is to get you started to thinking in the direction of regulatory compliance if you haven't already. You don't need to walk away knowing what applies directly to your product. So, but I do want you to have that understanding that when you are preparing your product for US or global markets, that you take into consideration, there is a major step to consider for successful product launch. And that is the puzzle of regulatory compliance, which is actually kind of fun because it's always changing. And sometimes I don't get the same type of request for six months. And so everything is always new to me. Without knowing the regulations that apply to your product, it can make it very expensive and difficult for you to dominate the global marketplace. So we never recommend the approach of jumping into the entire world at once, even if you have um, grandiose ideas of, of uh, market launch and you have distributors everywhere in the world. We recommend that you start asking questions a year or even two years ahead of when you want launch, when, of when you want to launch a product in any region. We call those tier one, tier two, and tier three countries. Tier one being your primary markets, typically US and Canada um, and Europe are right there in the, the tier one. The more that you know in advance, um, we can help you map out the requirements for each region so that you can make that best decision possible to market yourself, not only in an economical way, but in a legal way as well. So when you're working with your WTC contact, uh, try to ask for a compliance plan or as soon as you possibly can so that you can understand the regulations that apply to your product and you won't be surprised when you do have distributors and sales ready to be made in a country, and then you find out that it might take three months to get a certification. So even if planning in your head, say two years in advance seems um, a little lengthy, it's really not because even if you have an idea in your mind of where you want to be down the line, and it may not come to fruition for a couple of years, if you're not ready to launch into those regions, knowing what that process is can definitely give you some peace of mind to know what you're up against ahead of time. And two years in the compliance industry goes really fast. No different from raising kids. <laughs> so having a compliance plan early on will definitely help you from putting the cart before the horse um, and then making promises that your company might not be able to keep to distributors. It also eliminates repeated testing because sometimes you have to go back um, and redo some tests if the regulations have changed or you've done some tests and had you done them earlier for other countries, you could have saved yourself a lot of money by doing them at the same time. So something to keep in mind in that regard. So with just under 200 countries in the world, understanding global regulations can be very daunting. It is not a one size fits all situation. There could be many different certification marks as you see here on the slide. These are all actual marks that do exist that could be required to put on your product. There are more than 90,000 regulations, many of which will not apply to you, but it is a complicated puzzle to piece together without having a resource to help you sift through it all. So while it is daunting, going to Kevin and saying, hey, we need to have this conversation. Let's get Liz on a call as well. We can talk about exactly what is required for your product. Do you think compliance is expensive? Try non-compliance. That is not a joke. Compliance can be expensive, but it is a necessary evil. Non-compliance, however, and I see it every day, even with some of the largest Fortune 500 companies, it can be even more expensive, damage your reputation that you've worked so hard to, um, to lay out and then ruin your business. Worst of all, you can end up with consumers being hurt if the proper safety measures are not taken for your product. Fines from governments are becoming more widespread and it's becoming more common to actually be blacklisted from ever shipping to a country again if you are found to be consistently non-compliant with regulatory standards. They don't typically blacklist for a, a one-time, more of a, a fines and a slap on the hand, prove that you've done your work, and then you can come back and, and regain some authority with them. But um, but this is, you know, I'm, I'm sounding dramatic about it because it is. Like, th this is actually happening now where more and more companies are being blacklisted. They're being fined tens of thousands of dollars 
um, having products pulled from the marketplace, having products held in customs offices around the world, and they charge you a daily fee, but you have to go through hoops to get your product back. Who's going to pay to ship your product back? You're going to have your distributors do it. Are you going to do it yourself? You know, so there's so much that goes along with non-compliance that is not worth the risk. And you don't want to end up in the news. The bigger the company, the more damaging it can be when products are recalled for non-compliance or consumer harm. And I wrote an article that I shared with um, Kevin's team that I believe is on your website about the risks of non-compliance. So I would definitely recommend if you haven't read that already, just to get it back in your head um, to, you know, a little bit scare yourself to realize that these risks are, are real. Case in point right here. Um, if you recall the Volkswagen debacle years ago in which they illegally installed software in their diesel powered cars to evade complying with regulations, probably saved them tens of thousands of dollars in the beginning by doing it that way, not installing certified components. But in the end, they lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in sales because of forced product recalls. Like This is happening every day. You also might remember the hoverboard recall because um, the lithium ion batteries were catching on fire. The standards were written as a result after that started happening. The fallout from one company who had to deal with the brunt of this actually benefited numerous other companies who could apply the new standards and they paved the way to have other companies' products um, produce a much, to have other companies produce a much safer product for consumers. And while that article focused on fallen injury hazards, that wasn't even the brunt of it. The brunt of it was the actual lithium, lithium ion batteries catching on fire. There was a, a Mattel recall back in 2007 in which 1 million toys were recalled as a result of lead in their paint. So in addition to wireless and safety certifications for products, there are also very stringent environmental compliance regulations and they've become even more stringent in the last few years in the US and in Europe because of the toxins that are associated with paint and other um, harmful ingredients that are in products. So whether you're shipping your product to Europe, which has the WE directive, um, which is a recycling, uh, which is a recycling measure, and you have to prove that you have um, a recycling label and the instructions of how to recycle your product if it falls within the category. There are the Rojas and the REACH, which are um, directives, which are also environmental compliance that have to do with the very specific ingredients in your bill of materials in creating your product. Um, so there are standards associated with environmental compliance as well. And then California has their own. So just doing USA safety testing isn't enough. If you're shipping to California, there's very specific Prop 65 um, uh, regulations that are associated with products. And that has to do with chemicals that are going into their water. Uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission post product recalls on their effort on their website in an effort to establish a sense of safety for consumers. And not only are they being proactive in putting product recalls on their website, but there's actually a requirement that states that you must self-report to the CPSC if you are aware of safety risks associated with your own product. So even if you've done some safety testing, but not all of it, and there are, and you don't pass and you sell your product anyway. If, the, if your product is called out and they see, called out for safety risks, and they see that you have not self-declared on their website, there will be very high fines. So now we'll go into the global overview. This looks like a puzzle because that's exactly what global relation, uh, regulations are. We put puzzles, when we're doing puzzles in life, we put them together one piece at a time. And so while you can go global with several countries at one time and people uh, companies do, there are several individual steps that must be taken in order to launch successfully. Having the compliance plan that I mentioned earlier will walk you smoothly through the steps. There is an order to getting the certifications. Um, so I'm gonna go over some key countries today, but I obviously can't go through every single country in this presentation. So if there's a country that I touch on and you have more questions on, let's definitely chat about that outside of this um, webinar. And um, these are the ones that are really the most popular ones or the ones that have additional requirements outside of just document applications. I'm not gonna go over FCC requirements for North America today. Um, I will say that the FCC certifications, testing and certification is 
the foundation for quite a few countries. So assuming that you're going to go into your local market first, uh, we take those documents and we can use those for three quarters of the, I mean, really like 85% of the world, we can use the FCC documents and grants um, to get certifications. Now, not with Mexico. So our first country that I'm going to talk about here, the natural step that we can go to after U.S. is Mexico, which is our neighbor to the South. Uh, Mexico changes its regulatory compliance requirements almost every single year in some way. If you don't stay on top of these regulations, your product could be held at customs, and they do. I'm very familiar with some clients of mine that chose to um, forego the risks and go ahead and ship right through, and they didn't label everything correctly, and their product got held in customs for months. Um, again, like I said earlier, they could be returned to sender, fines can be issued. Uh, Mexico does not pig piggyback at all on U.S. certification process. They have their own in-country requirements, regardless of any amount of money that you spent on testing for the U.S. They require their own in-country Mexico testing and certification at one of their labs. Your one product might have three or four different certification requirements alone for Mexico entry, depending on the functions and the technical side of your product. You also are gonna need a registered local importer to ship into Mexico, for example. And we can help um, answer questions about all of that. Uh, to give a quick example, if you have a wireless device and an external power supply, and you're shipping it together as a kit, you're gonna need an IFATEL certification, which covers the wireless testing and certification. You'll have to test for that, and that takes several weeks. You're going to need a non-safety certification um, for because it includes that power supply. But if you send the power supply separate, you're also going to need an individual power supply certification on its own. So you'll have the IPATEL certificate, the non-safety certificate selling that as a kit, and then any replacement parts that have to be sent. If you're sending replacement parts like the power supply on its own, it will need its own certification because you're sending it on its own. Not every country is like that. Mexico is one of those special ones. Um, so definitely talking to somebody and saying, we're going to Mexico in three months. What are the requirements? Super key to know what they are. Mexico does hold products in customs and they will um, charge you for that. Most countries in South America are fairly simple to get into. They do piggyback off what you completed for North America. So most of the South American countries require documentation process, like having FCC reports or grants, your CB reports for safety, um, and some additional manufacturing and document information. It's a, it's a packet of information that you submit, you wait a couple of weeks and you get your certificate and you can ship into their country. Two countries in South America have their own in-country testing and certification requirements like Mexico does, and those are Argentina and Brazil. Their lead times are upwards of eight to 12 weeks. So planning ahead is crucial. Waiting till you are ready to ship to start the certification process when you already have vendors that are waiting to carry your product can push your launch back by several months if you don't start it in advance. So one of the takeaways that you should, you should have from today, if anything, is plan, plan, plan ahead when you are even thinking about shipping into certain countries, especially if they require in-country testing. They don't always work um, smoothly. Uh, COVID has changed everything, the way that they do their certification processes, and that has put a delay for a lot of countries. So here we have Africa. South Africa is the only country in Africa that has regulatory requirements outside of document submission. All the other 50, or I want to say, I think there's 55 countries, maybe 58 in Africa. All the other countries either don't have any regulations at all, and you can ship your product without any certifications, or they piggyback on the U.S. and they have grant, you know, you, you attach the documents and you, it's a simple application process. Uh, there are very rigorous requirements, though, for South Africa, and it could take months to get through because their certification process not only can be painfully slow, but there's always a long line of people wanting. And then if you end up in the back of that queue, then it's going to take even longer. And I'm talking three to six months, depending on the type of the product that you have and what the technologies are within. Um, about, I want to say, seven or eight years ago, I think eight years ago, the ACASA lab, which is the certification or the body, the certification body offices caught on fire, a computer caught on fire and the whole thing shut down. It took a year and a half for some people who had even already started the process and were almost done. They had to start over again. It took upwards of a year and a half for some people to get certifications for South Africa. And I don't think they've ever fully recovered, to be honest. Some of their certifi certificates are only a couple of weeks um, and some of them are 
six months or longer. Not to deter you from going there. I'm just, I want to make sure that these things are just mentioned so that you've heard it in your head and you remember, oh, I remember hearing it taking this long to get into this country. I just want to plant these seeds so you guys can start um, planning ahead of time. Australia and New Zealand are pretty cut and dry, fairly simple to get through, but they do have their own requirements and, and a mark marking system. They follow European requirements. So if you do have third-party test reports from an accredited lab, um, they, those test reports will often show the Australia and New Zealand deviations that need to be listed on your reports. That's really all you need to do to get your certifications unless there is something specific to an, a type of product. Um, there are certain electrical products that have a, a different um, RCM mark as well. Not going to spend too much time on Russia for obvious reasons, but I want you to be aware that they do have a certification process that is within country. Um, they also have a group certification that incorporates some of the region, uh, Belarus and some of the other countries, Kazakhstan, I don't remember all of them, I think there's five of them at one time, that you can get a whole group certificate and that one certificate will meet the requirements for all five countries. So that's super helpful if you think that you might be going into the whole region versus just going into Russia. You can get just the Russia certification or the group one and go into all five of the regions. Not too many Russia certifications happening right now. Uh, the Middle East uh, can be a little bit complicated because they do have a registration system as well. So UAE and Saudi Arabia follow IEC requirements that are similar to the European Union but they do require specific types of their own certifications and marks. And you have to have a registered importer in their SABER system, which can be um, a little clunky. It's a fairly new system. I think I wanna say two, three years old. Um, so as long as you do have a registered importer and then you follow their process, then um, they're actually not terrible. They're not, they're not too hard to get those certifications for, but they do require a, spe a specific process. Asia is a little bit different. China, I would say, is one of the most difficult and lengthy processes for compliance certification. You will be required to ship samples as part of an in-country testing process, no matter what you've done already. Um, also, and, and that could take, I mean, I've seen some China projects go between one and two years because the product wasn't ready to be shipped and um, you're probably not gonna get the products back. Uh, what else was this? I feel like I had something else to say about China, but I can't remember that one right now. Um, Indonesia is currently not allowing any new manufacturer certificates to be issued at all because they want to make they want manufacturers to work with their local Indonesian manufacturers for producing product in country. Um, so that can be a little bit of a process, and we can definitely talk about that one um, later on if you do have product that you want to ship not not manufactured in Indonesia but being shipped there. Europe requires the CE mark, and we will be discussing that in um, greater detail at our webinar in March. I don't know if you guys have signed up for that one, but that's definitely going to be a good one. And our um, CE mark expert is going to be very detailed about the process, what's involved specifically, definitions and terms that are important to know, um, and the impact that Brexit had on the regulatory compliance program and how that will affect your product shipping into the UK. The CE mark tells the consumer that your product meets all of the directives and standards that apply to your product. It's not just a marketing tool that can establish confidence in, in a consumer. It's actually, once you apply that mark, you are legally bound to be able to have that paperwork and the test reports to back up that CE mark. So as soon as you put that on your product, and I've seen this happen with companies who put it on just to say, oh yeah, we have it. We wanna make it look like we have a great product that meets safety standards. And if they get called, um, through market surveillance and their product is pulled and they don't have test reports and they don't have a technical file, that is a very big no-no. Um, big mark, big, that's, that's where the blacklisting can start come in. And you do also need local representation in Europe for, uh, to carry your technical file to show evidence of your CE mark. As well, um, in that process for CE mark, Sorry, skip that one. Um, you need to identify the directives. That's always gonna be the first step. The directives and regulations that apply to your product. The directive is a law that states that you have these such and such standards to comply to. Every country in Europe will accept the same regulations since they're harmonized, 
but the individual countries of Europe might have extra regulations that apply to one country, like France could have its own specifics for your product type that the other countries don't have. So it's not just a matter of looking at these directives and regulations, it's also the individual standards per country that could apply, like how we have the California Prop 65 here in the US. So the directives are harmonized, the regulations can be country specific. Then you need to identify the standards and the testing requirements. If there are tests that are required that you don't have documentation for, you must get that testing done. The testing could have been done um, by a China manufacturer and you have their documents and you're putting their module or, the, or, or rebranding it under your name. That's totally fine as long as you can get that back up. You don't have to be the one to do the testing. You can get documents from a, the original um, equipment manufacturer or the modular certifications and so on. Uh, but you do need to have that evidence because that all goes into the technical file that you have to have on hand if your product is called out. You are legally required also to have a local authorized rep, like I mentioned, who carries that technical file. And once you meet all of those requirements, you sign the declaration of conformity and you can apply the CE mark and, and uh, any of the labeling requirements on your packaging. The person who signs the declaration of conformity saying that you have met these requirements is personally responsible for any liability. Uh, we can go, we're definitely going to go into much greater detail at that March webinar. So again, I encourage you to sign up for that one. Cover after covering CE mark, you, uh, the UK and Northern Ireland used to be part of the European Union. And now that they're not because of Brexit, um, and again, this will also be covered next month, the UK decided to have their own requirements and their own mark. So right now, they have extended their deadline. Um, it was supposed to be in effect two years ago, and thank goodness they keep postponing it by a year. So through they have extended their deadline through December 31st of this year. So effective January 1 of 2024, you will have to not only have a CE mark on your product to go to Europe, but you're going to have to have one for shipping into the UK as well. Right now, you can still ship into the UK with a CE mark, or you can get the UK, UK CA mark now, but you will need to have either a CE mark this year or a UK CA. You can get all of them. By next year, it's a document process. I don't think they're forcing any new testing right now. So basically, you'll be taking your CE technical file and using that, and it's it's almost like a copy paste. They're taking all those documents and just getting a new certificate with those documents. It's redundant and it's an extra step and it's a money maker. <clears throat> and I'm surprised more countries aren't doing that because they are. It is a great way for them to to make more money for their country. And on top of that, you're going to have to have a local representation in the UK as well. So if you already have your local authority um, holding your technical file for Europe, you're going to need to have another one on ground with an office on ground in the UK. And again, we're going to cover all the details of that. So I would say if you're going to be shipping into the UK, starting these conversations now, if not by June or July of this year, starting to get your ducks in a row for what the requirements could be if they do continue on um, making this effective December or January 1st. Okay, I'll give you a second to read this cartoon because while it is funny, it is spot on. Uh, in, in the compliance industry, a lot of, I mean, our, our life is changing every single day with the types of technology that is coming out and the authorities can't stay on top of it fast enough. They don't know what everybody's making before it happens. And so sometimes they're fumbling their way through, the certification bodies are, and writing the regulations as, after the products are coming out. Compliance varies widely across the world. The only constant is that it's always changing, which is the fun part of my job. It's also maddening. There are products that don't have regulations yet, but that doesn't mean that you can sit back and put your feet up and say it doesn't apply to me because tomorrow it can. So these constantly changing regulations require vigilance on our part and on the manufacturer's part. If And not, and not only in a product that you already have out there, if you're making changes to your product and it didn't have regulations before, you're gonna to wanna to double check that even if you just made one cosmetic change or you increased the voltage the, um, you know, of, of a product or you added a new technology to it, any change that needs that is done to your product is now considered a new product. And so unless you're just changing the color, 
which has no impact, you know, just a cosmetic change. Um, I highly recommend anytime you're considering changing a product and updating it, anything you're going to be sent out is going to have regulations associated with it. So um, definitely um, reach out to your WTC contact to find out how changes to current products are going to impact your regulations and certification requirements. So what are your options? You've got three options basically when it comes to compliance. You can ignore it and take on the risks, which you have every right to do. Um, anytime that I give advisement to people on what their requirements are for their product, I'm never telling them you have to do it. I'm not judging anybody. I'm not putting pressure on you to do it. I'm telling you, I'm advising you on what the regulations are and um, you get to do what you want with that information. A lot of companies do ignore it because they don't have it in their budget and it's not that big of a deal and we're only sending 10 out. You know, That's a whole conversation later on is how many you're sending out. We can talk about that as well. Um, even the largest companies are ignoring compliance requirements. You can do the, so that's your first option. Your second option would be do the bare minimum to comply to get into countries. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's totally fine. Um, or you can stay abreast of changes and forecast how those changes will impact uh, your device in future markets. We call that global compliance mapping, which I briefly mentioned earlier. It's taking what you've already done or not done, laying out any regulatory gaps, and helping to establish a plan to use what you already have to get into countries or see what is still needed so that you don't pay for duplicate testing unnecessarily. Um, we can come to you ahead of time and say, hey, if you do testing right now for these three countries, you can use it for these 80 countries. You know, So the more you know ahead of time by doing multiple country testing at one time can actually improve your, it, it can benefit your budget down the line instead of having to redo certain tests. Um, and I'm trying to pay attention to the time so that we can get to questions too, but um, that does remind me North America, uh, Canada piggybacks a little bit on the US. And so if you're gonna go into Canada in five years from now, but you're thinking about it, it actually is more economical to do the few additional tests for Canada now when you're doing your FCC certifications, because then you're not taking a test report and then coming back in five years and redoing that test because you're going to have to redo a lot of them instead of just the one additional one that might be needed to do it ahead of time with your FCC. So little things like that about thinking, what am I doing down the line? Can I do some testing now that'll subtract from testing costs in the future? That's really it. If you do have any questions um, about anything that I haven't covered or something that I did cover today, um, you can reach out to me directly and I shouldn't have taken that. I'll, I'll put my phone number in the chat here, but you can reach out to me directly. I think I stopped sharing. Yeah, you did. Okay, good. You can reach out to me directly, but please mention that you were on this webinar so I can have a chat with Kevin and let him know the benefits of this and that people are asking questions to me um, from his, his uh, list here of people that are invited. Or you can go ahead and reach out directly to Kevin and he can set up a meeting with all of us or just me and you and whatever whatever works best um, down the line, just so that we can keep track of, of who reached out to me that was part of this team. There, thank you very much for this. This is a great introduction. Um, and there are a couple of questions that a couple of texts came in. Um, one of them is, and, and this is really actually quite, I think, quite topical. If I have, um, do I need certification to sell on Amazon? In other words, ah. international e-commerce. Yes. So we are an Amazon network service provider also. Um, just because you've done your certification for, let's call it the US or Canada or even Europe, doesn't mean that you have met all of Amazon's requirements. And they, this last year was unprecedented with how many people that they kicked off of their Amazon sellers platform. That's where everybody is selling now. So if you have a website and you're selling from your website globally, having your FCC certification doesn't mean that you're legit to sell to other countries. Can it go door to door? Can it get there and not have any problems? Absolutely. It happens every day. People can ship out for two years and nobody can ever complain and no one will find out. That's the honest truth. There's also the other honest truth of people do find out. And so, um, again, weighing these risks, Amazon, it, it, we can just do a quick Amazon compliance plan for you. Sh you send me the documents to show me what you already have, any testing you've done. We'd, we'd give you a rundown of an Amazon compliance plan of what they do require do a check a checklist of those documents that you need 
Um, if anything's missing, we would tell you your test reports are outdated or this actually is a different product. You have a new product that you're selling under that same test report. So we would tell you, we'd guide you on what additional documents are needed so you can go back to Amazon and um, fulfill their requirements. Because when they lock you out, they're not going to tell you everything that's missing. They're going to just say, you do not meet our requirements. You have to come back. Or, we're, I mean, they'll give you like, we're kicking you off in two days. Like they don't give you a lot of time. And now you're losing money because you're losing sales on every single day. Right. Um, another question was, is, is there an easy way to tell if my product has regulatory compliance requirements? You know, in other words, I'm selling product X. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's anything about this product that I have to deal with. Um, assume that there are. <laughs> Uh, and I only say that because even if it's a tire and there's nothing electrical and there's nothing, nothing wireless, there's no sensors attached to it for a tire pressure monitoring system or anything like that, there, there is something because if it blows up or if it's in a hazardous zone, you know, there might be hazardous location requirements that need to be met or something where you're manufacturing it. My answer to that, just to be general without knowing anything about the product is there, I would be 99% sure that there's something. The easy thing to do is contact Kevin or me and find out what they are. Look, you're going to, if you go down the rabbit hole of Google, it's very daunting and very confusing. I'm not saying you can't, you will find some information out there for sure that can guide you. Um, but not everything, it's like doing a medical checkup online. Not everything on WebMD is going to apply to your symptoms. And so you're just going to freak yourself out, I think, a lot by looking online um, when you can get some easy answers really fast. So um, I would say if you don't know what's required, just call and ask. Right. Now, a good example of that is um, uh, I was talking with a small manufacturer here in Northern California that has a purely mechanical device, and he thought he didn't need to have CE because there was no electrical or radio frequency or anything else. But it turned out he did have to do some testing because of load limits and then pinch points and things like that because it was manually operated. And so, um, yeah. but we got you know we got it through that testing pretty quickly and easily. So. Yeah, and environmental compliance. People forget that environmental compliance exists and you cannot be technically compliant for CE if you've not done your due diligence for um, environmental compliance. Right, very good. All right, um, well, we're gonna keep this at 45 minutes so we'll wrap up. Okay. If there are other questions, please um, reach out to either myself or you can call Liz and, and we can certainly help you with those questions around regulatory product compliance. Once again, you know, our intent in this is to provide education resources and connections to help businesses thrive um, in the global marketplace. And the reason we do that is because, you know, international businesses typically survive economic cycles better than domestic only counterparts. They're good for the, you know, the company, it's good for the regions in which they live, you know, so there's a lot of reasons to be engaged in international business. We want to make that easier. Um, definitely join us on, let me look at the date, um, March. Hang on a second. Let me get back to. Uh, I don't have it written down in front of me. I should have. Uh, it you know, I have it. Just Sorry. Give me half a second. There we go. Uh, March, Wednesday, March 22nd. Uh, we're going to do a deeper dive. Um, into the CE market in Brexit. Um, I know there's a number of companies that's in this uh, area here in Northern California where this is very topical. So please join us for that. And if there's any other questions or if we can be of help, please reach out and let us know. And I wanna thank everybody for joining us. And Liz, thank you very much for taking time today. Pleasure. Um, to help share some information and uh, educate us. If there's any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll answer those. And thank you. Thanks, Kimberly. Absolutely. It is it is complex information. And so I do feel like I kind of verbally vomited all over you guys with so much in a short amount of time. But again, it's just to plant those seeds. You don't need to remember everything that I said. Just know that you've heard it at some point and this could apply to you. If you're a service provider and you're doing marketing or design um, for clients and you're not the actual manufacturer, I see some of you um, are could be service providers. The more that you know, even though it's outside of your scope per se, the more that you can plant those seeds to your clients because you can do all the design and packaging and all that wonderful um, part of marketing for your client if they haven't met regulatory requirements and you haven't made room on their label or their package, their beautiful package that you design, then you have to go back and be able to make room for the labeling requirements that, that must be met. So um, knowing all about regulatory compliance can really go hand in hand for design companies as well. 
Perfect. And we will be taking and sending out a follow-up email with um, Liz's slide deck, as well as a link to the recording for everybody that attended and for those that weren't able to make it today. With that, we will say thank you very much and wish you a fabulous rest of your day. Thank you all. Thanks for attending. Appreciate it. Bye-bye now. Thanks, Kevin.